We are celebrating the season of Easter in the Christian church, and what a celebration it truly is. We celebrate God's promise to us of eternal life, as demonstrated by Jesus' promise, his promise that where he goes beyond this earthly life, he goes to prepare a room for us, for you and for me. And he will come so that where we will be, he will take us to where he will be and be with us for eternity. Friends, there is nothing greater than the power of God, not even death. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. In other words, God holds the greatest power that exists. And God's love for us is an eternal love. It's a, a no matter what kind of love, no strings attached, no conditions. And the empty tomb, the empty tomb is proof of God's power over death. That fact that humanity survived the inhuman act of killing Jesus on the cross is proof of God's eternal love for us. Why? Well, think about it. If ever there were a time in human history with all the times that we have failed God, all the times that we have messed up, if ever there was a time in human history where God would have cause, where God would have good reason to wipe every single human being off the face of the earth and begin again, it should have been 2,000 years ago when those misguided people nailed Jesus to the cross. God's response? Well, we know God's response. God's response was not to wipe out the human race. Indeed, God's response was love. Love. God's response was love. And I find this very fascinating because we live in a world today where there seems to be a lot of people who just want to allege that they have some kind of insider knowledge as to the mind of God, that they have some kind of claim to know the intent of God. And some of these people stand behind pulpits, that's true. Some write publications or appear on televised shows claiming that God causes um, deadly diseases, God causes storms and earthquakes and hurricanes as a direct result of how angry God is with us. Our God is a God of love. L-O-V-E, love. Our God is not a God of vengeance. Our God is not a God of retribution. Our God is a God of love. And if God ever was to punish us for our behavior, for anything, it certainly would have been 2,000 years ago when we destroyed God's precious gift to us. And our gift from God was a gift of love. And that is what we celebrate this Easter season. However, never let us forget that we live in a world where so many people do not know about this gift of love, or they don't accept it. They don't think they're worthy of it, or they have to do something to get it, right? And they hear these other voices proclaiming that God is a punishing God. And a lot of the people in the world go, really? Is that how God is? So friends, we are called to counter these messages with the true message, the message of God's love for us. John 3.16, the Gospel of John says, God loves us so much that God gave us the gift of God's only Son, and whoever believes in him will never perish but have eternal life. For God sent Jesus into this world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it asserts that God showed great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. And then there's Romans 8, 38 that reveals nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. In fact, friends, search your Bibles or just Google God's love. Google those two words, God's love, and a huge multitude of scripture references just pop up supporting this faith belief. So our extraordinary Christian story of God's love for us began with Jesus uh, coming to us, God sending Jesus to us, and it continues with an empty tomb. But we know that the story doesn't end there, does it? 
On that very first Easter morning, uh, those who arrived very first at the tomb, they didn't peer in and, and see it empty and said, yep, Jesus did just what he said he'd do. He beat death and now he's gone and we won't see him again till we get to heaven. Other people that day must have pondered, did he really rise from the dead? In hindsight, we already know the answer, right? But for those that experienced that very first Easter, they must have pondered, did the resurrection really happen? So we're going to hear now where the story picks up, where we left off on Easter morning, when Mary discovered that empty tomb on that very first Easter. She ran and she told other disciples of the miracle. And presumably, they probably spent a good portion of the rest of that day visiting the tomb, right? They all went back examining like CSI agents. They were examining the, the empty contents, talking about all the possibilities. And morning would turn to evening and eventually... When it was evening of that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus said this, he showed them his his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when Jesus has said this, he, he breathed on them and said these words, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the disciples named Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, he was not with them when Jesus came. And when he finally arrived later, Jesus had departed. The other disciples told them, we've seen the Lord. But doubting Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails on his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand on his side, I will not believe. So a week passes. A week later, his disciples were again in the house. And this time Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, locked, Jesus came. And stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Jesus turns to Thomas and says, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. (laughs) Well, then Thomas answered Jesus, "My, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, and they're not written in this gospel, this book, but these are written so that you, this is what the writer writes in the Bible, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Our very joyous Easter celebration of this Easter promise must never overshadow humanity's darkest time. Jesus' resurrection was preceded by his crucifixion. And lest anyone ever doubt that someone could survive such an ordeal, friends, make no mistake. You see, it was the Romans who had introduced and over time very well perfected this horrific means of terrible torture, which left absolutely no victim alive. To hang on a cross, suspended by your wrists, struggling to inhale each breath, it would become more and more difficult with each inhalation as the muscles of the diaphragm become exhausted from the sheer weight of the human body until attempts to inhale would become sheer torture. Eventually, the person hanging on the cross would weaken Usually, at last, usually no more than a matter of hours, one was no longer capable of inhaling, and then death would come quickly. Well, we know from the story that Jesus was truly dead. The cross took his last human breath. 
He did not survive the ordeal. No one came and spirited his near dead body away and then revived him through medicinal means. No, no, the Romans were very, very adept and very thorough in employing crucifixion. No one ever survived. And let's not forget, there are a lot of other people present that day on that dark Friday who witnessed his death. And seeing is believing, right? And yet, just a few days later, the risen Lord appeared, right? People witnessed his presence, and seeing is believing, right? And what the Lord, the risen Lord did then was he, he breathed on them. It's interesting because the Greek translation of this verb to breathe in this passage occurs only here in the Christian scriptures, the New Testament. And its usage clearly evokes the description of of God breathing, God breathing the breath of life into that very first human in the story that's found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Jesus is breathing the the holy breath on those followers might be envisioned as, as a new or a second creation, something that did not exist before now exists. Yeah. And those who believed in what they saw now received new life as children of God. Holy breathing, holy breath empowered those present that day. (laughs) Except Thomas, right? He missed it. Well, what's that about? Thomas eventually arrived. We know that. However, he doubted. And what was, the, what was the risen Lord to do? Well, when the next comes the opportunity for Thomas to encounter the risen Lord, the Lord had allowed Thomas to touch him. Don't you find that remarkable? I mean, just in that act alone, day, doubt becomes faith. One who did not believe now believes. Doubting Thomas experienced transformation from this experience from suspicion to believer, from uncertainty to certainty, from skepticism to assurance, Thomas touched and gained faith. Well, even today, people want proof in order to believe. People question if it really ever happened, this this resurrection after three days. Some have pondered and wondered if it could have been a trick or misdirection or deception even. And others ponder if the story is just a myth, a hoax. Well, like Thomas, friends, we all have doubts from some time in our lives. Everyone does. It's part of our human nature to doubt things. But how do we move beyond doubt to faith? Well, let's begin by looking at the big picture, the the whole story of God revealed to us. This God who, who created this unbelievably beautiful, wondrous planet in the middle of the vastness of space, literally an oasis in the middle of a galactic desert, is the same God who gives us the gift of life. Our God who continues to create new life every spring, as we right now are experiencing all around us, new life in humanity each and every moment of every day. Our God creates new life to us, through us, within us, on the power of the Holy Spirit, the very breath, the wind of God breathing on us. And this God who created the spark of life in all of us could This be the same God able to bring back the one who demonstrated such grace and love and compassion for us? Well, friends, of that I have absolutely no doubt. God is capable of that and so much more. Our God is a mighty God. On all that is needed on our part to receive this gift is faith. Faith to to believe in that which seems unbelievable. Faith to believe in, in that which seems impossible is possible. I love what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
In the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 7, it reminds us that God has given us the wind, the breath, the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. On Easter, on Easter, God turned doubters into the faithful. As I said in the beginning, nothing is greater than the power of God, not even death. And nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus. So brothers and sisters in Christ, allow this day to be the day that you renew your faith or embrace faith for the very first time. God's promise of eternal love for you. God loves you no matter what. And let us with glad and expectant hearts embrace this truth, my friends, that truly God loves you. God loves me. God loves us no matter what. Let's pray. Loving God, how quickly after Easter do we just settle back into our everyday normal routines, acting as if nothing has changed in our lives. and We really aren't so different from those early disciples, uh, even Thomas who had his doubts, but eventually even the disciples would return to their fishing. And yet things are different. And we are continually surprised and delighted by the many ways that the resurrected Christ appears in our sacred, ordinary, daily living. We meet the Christ in the breaking of the bread with our family and our friends and even with strangers. We meet the Christ in our places of play and school and work in our daily tasks and in the errands that we run, in the little acts of love and support that come our way, we even meet the Christ in those unlikely places, like a hospital waiting room, in the eyes of a homeless person, in the rebellious struggles of a teenager in search of an identity, in the concern of a single parent for a child, in the quiet witness of our elderly, And yet, O God, we are still reluctant to respond to that presence. It is still difficult to follow. It is still difficult to care for others the way that we know that we should. The Christ continually confronts us with the question, do you love me? And Lord, we respond, well, yes, we love you. And then just too easily we settle back into a comfortable faith. Lord, you call us to discipleship, to feed the sheep of this world, but we continue to hold back. So loving Christ, hear our prayer. Walk with us and teach us to walk with you. Energize us, breathe on us as you did those first disciples, to reach out to one another in love and in mission. Make us instruments of your peace that we might give hope to the hopeless, strength to the faltering, love to the lonely, consolation to the grieving, and faith to the faithless. And teach us to live more daringly, more expectantly, more joyfully, and transform us with your Holy Spirit that we may honor the risen Christ in active discipleship each and every day of our lives. And all of God's children say, Amen.